So um, please don't think that I don't um, love and think that maker spaces and um, hacker spaces and all such things in such um, those type of things aren't wonderful because I do. I think they're um, the most amazing things um, to come out for a long time. I may sound a little bit negative on a couple of points here, only because I've been at the front line since September, and I'm a bit rattled, because it's, it's pretty full on. And I think one of the main reasons of that is, um, as we were talking just a moment ago about uh, don't be afraid to fail. Um, I've always been able to solve people's problems when they come into the library. I can fix up their computers, perhaps to a certain degree, and I can solve their information problems, and I can be a librarian. And I'm quite proud of what I can do in my role as a librarian for, for a public library, um, a large and busy public library service. However, I didn't have the skill set to, uh, to launch full on into a makerspace, really. But I've learned that that's OK, because even though I didn't really know what I was doing a lot of the time, um, the kids, and we were catering to nine to 16 year olds largely, the kids loved it and they explored it. And after a while, I got to realise that actually it's okay if uh, we don't actually finish a project or it doesn't work out at the end of the, the session, we'll get there in the end. Or even if we don't, we're gonna have an awful lot of fun along the way. So um, having that permission to fail, um, yes, having that reinforced today is once again wonderful. Um, okay, so. There we go, there's our logo. How we did it. Macquarie Regional Council Libraries, we were successful in a grant of $24,875 via the State Library Vision 2017 Creative Communities Funding. Why we didn't just ask for $25,000, i am not sure, because that was the maximum. <laughs> That's what the budget worked out to be. Um, this combined with some fantastic support from my best mate, Daniel. Um, is he still here? Daniel, thank you again, um, and a couple of his staff members. Um, at the edge and a good ounce of courage and we had the beginnings of Maker Spaces. This was uh, our launch. We launched over two days, late September 2013. Uh, it was uh, during school holidays. It was open to nine to 16 year olds. It was enormous. <laughs> we uh, we had ended up having to cap everything, um, as in the uh, cap the numbers. And they just kept coming and coming, and they still keep coming. Um, so as you can see, Mick, that was Mick Byrne with a, a goatee from State Library. So, uh, sorry, from the Edge, there's Danielle, who's moved on from the Edge now. But we, it was great to have these guys with us for those two days. Uh, and very reassuring, and I cried when they left me. <laughs> but there's, uh, there's, we call him Dave. That's our 3D printer. He's a maker bot. He cost us close to $3,000. Uh, he's largely, he's not been too uh, temperamental, however he has been moved around a bit because we've uh, presented 26 sessions um, in total uh, in 33 weeks at four of our six library locations, So, and he doesn't like moving a lot, so you've got to give him a, a bit of TLC after you've moved him around a bit. Um, but he's doing a good job and he largely stands up to the task. Where the money went, there's a breakdown of where the money went. And in hindsight, as is always really good vision hindsight, I should not have spent, or we should not have spent that amount of money on the website. It's largely just a blog uh, that uh, we were charged an awful lot of money to create. I mean, it looks good, but um, uh, that could have been uh, better assessed. The larger, I suppose, I think the largest amount of money has gone to consumables, which are things like LEDs and um, you know components and bits of PVC piping and lumps of wood and bits of metal and as much as we're uh, building up a good cachet now of recyclable parts and a good storage thing um, that we can reuse things, uh, building that bank up uh, took a little bit of funding. Um, this is a quote from um, um, Maker, what was it? Manufacturers Monthly magazine. The maker culture puts emphasis on sharing knowledge and one's creative efforts with what's made both super modern and occasionally the opposite. So I just thought that was um, absolutely apt. See this lady here? Her name is Margaret James. She is a previous colleague of mine. Her and I uh, put the grant application together, uh, came up with a concept, et cetera, et cetera, and then she left me. <laughs> and she's gone, she didn't just leave, she went to Darwin. 
Oh, my God, she's managing a, a university bookshop up there. So, um, yes, for uh, our makerspaces was always designed to be a two librarian position, so it wasn't all consuming for one. And then um, uh, since she left and it took them four months to fill her position <laughs> with me, and then another three months to fill my old position, and so I've been doing it all on my Pat Malone up until just a few weeks ago um, when a new young adult librarian was appointed who was hopefully going to be here today but has been ill. Um, so, yes, uh, consider your staffing because that has been our absolute main challenge. This is... Um, Another little video of a bit of a compilation of some of the sessions. I do have a lot more video, um, but did not have the opportunity to put a lot of it together, I'm afraid. We're not in a condensed form. Uh, we've had a couple of mentors. Uh, my partner, mainly. Uh, Marcel, that's him with the big moustache. And, uh, and his mate, Al, um, a builder and a diesel fitter, um, respectively. And um, they're both self-employed, so whenever possible, they were able to lend me a hand on a Tuesday afternoon when we had our magazine session. Uh, that gentleman there is Brendan from CQ University, Mackay Campus. He hasn't been able to attend since we started up again this year, though. Um, yeah, we made a billy cart, so it can be everything from Arduinos to the billy cart. And um, a wind tube. Um, so lots of different things happening all the time at various sessions. Um, it would just evolve. That was that's Jeremy. He is our one of our Nubo Uber nerds. Um, lovely, lovely young man, and um, he uh, actually um, got me to 3D print a case for his Raspberry Pi. So yes, he's right into it. Um, challenges, staffing. That was really our main, main challenges. I said I was on my own, and it, you know, like Mammy, that's Mammy. <laughs> um, staffing. Um, there was, um, apart from the fact that um, it became very consuming for me, it also put more pressure on our branches because I needed an offside, certainly during the sessions and hopefully occasionally for a little bit of prep, not that that happened very often. But even though um, just trying to be able to get hold of a library assistant in our branches at the moment is very tough and it doesn't look like it's going to get any better, we don't have any money for more staff. So having somebody who is willing and able to come along and give me a hand and get dirty and handle the kids and handle the technology and not be afraid is really, really tough. Okay? So you need to think about your staffing seriously um, in the process. I'm not saying don't do it, for God's sake, don't think I'm saying that, but please think about that and be confident about your staffing. Um, and the knowledge, it will... It, <laughs> grows in dribs and drabs. I've just about got my Arduino program so that when my duck starts quacking on at 4.30 in the morning, there's going to be one of those, I'm um, hopefully in, in one of that nuclear power gun that um, Zoz. <laughs> what? <laughs> That'll work. <laughs> um, so, you know, it does come, it does build up. But once again, you need the time to be able to do that. Hence the staffing issue again, because you also need to be able to, well, certainly I did, attend to our branch responsibilities, desk shifts, my other positions as young adult librarian and now digital literacy librarian and classes and training, and, and, and I'm sure you're all aware. So um, having the time to be able to commit to uh, get that knowledge is uh, something you also need to think about. I have spent a lot of my weekends, um, and so has my partner, sussing out Arduinos, and um, I haven't got to the Raspberry Pi yet, but you know, um, and various types of things, experimenting with conductive paint and getting, <laughs> it can be a lot of fun, but it can also be very time consuming, so just things to keep in mind. Space, this was a challenge for, uh, we do have a bit of space in a couple of our larger branches, but once again, not a lot of spa, not space that could, where the kit could be left. It had to be packed up onto our trolleys and so forth, um, and then put away, uh, and then get in, the, in a back room somewhere um, where hopefully it wasn't, you know, a safety hazard, etc. and workplace health and safety is roaming around and giving me a great deal of grief. Um, and then in a couple of our smaller branches it um, was, yeah, very tough. But not impossible, just tough. Um, my other greatest challenge was support. Apart from my, my partner, Marcel, and his mate, Al, um, and a little bit from uh, Brendan at CQU, I could not manage to attain and retain uh, mentors from the community at this point in time. I've not given up, and I will keep nagging and trying. Um, but 
um, I'm missing something, I'm not doing something right, I haven't been able to get them. Um, so what I think I'm going to do is actually go um, forward to um, conduct maker sessions for the big guys, for the grown-ups, and hopefully I can recruit some, uh, some people from there uh, to become mentors, because I know they're there. I just can't get them to come in and, you know, give me some of their time and their knowledge. So, um, but like I say, I haven't given up. Um, uh, sorry, I've got a minute. Statistics, we had 469 attendees uh, over the course of those 26 sessions in total, an average of just over 18 per session, and um, don't think that that's indicative of it being like small, because if you get 18 teenagers in a room playing with stuff, I can swear you are flat bloody out. And um, we had to cap the numbers. I capped them at 20, but it quite often ended up being more like 25, because I didn't like to turn them away once they turned up. Um, and um, I put a hold on all promotion um, in terms of uh, opening it up to more kids because I didn't want to have to keep turning them away. They love it, they want it, they need it, they really do. There are so many kids who just, just do not have um, a backyard and a granddad or you know all of that equivalent. So I'll just leave you with the quote, a mind that is stretched by a new experience can never go back to its old dimensions, which I quite like. Um, so please go to it, be aware of the, uh, the issues along the way, but, um, but don't be discouraged. Thank you. Good afternoon. Thank you for your patience while I loaded my Prezi. A new and popular space has emerged on the lower level of the Logan Hyperdome Library. It's called the TLC Lounge. TLC is short for Tech, Learn, Create. This space is no longer a traditional library space, but a newly transformed, fully flexible, multi-generational space catering for the diverse needs of the Logan community. Over the past 12 months, and with the assistance of the Vision 2017 grant program for creative community spaces, Logan City Council have undertaken a large refurbishment project at the Logan Hyperdome Library. The aptly called original upside down project literally meant that what was downstairs needed to come upstairs. Technology that was located upstairs needed to go downstairs, so it was a real change. Okay. Available? In our space are a 3D printer. We have the MakerBot replicated to tablet devices, touchscreen computers, gaming consoles, iPads, a projector and screen, musical instruments, public computers, a retro arcade machine, free Wi Fi, and an ebook bar with access to e-magazines, e-books, e-newspapers and online resources. The space works. It works because it is meeting the diverse needs of the Logan community. Since its opening this year on Library Lovers Day, it has become a popular destination. There is keen interest in everything that is on offer, including, and in particular, the 3D printer, diverse programming, and access to new technology and online resources. We are seeing increased interest from non-traditional audiences, particularly in regards to who is coming into the library to access the 3D printer, and through the promotion of community engagement and collaboration. Staff expertise has also increased. There was significant buy-in from the staff throughout the project, and this continues daily as they all take on the challenge of learning how to use the new technology whilst assisting customers to learn as well. So it's been a real learning environment, and some of the customers um, are really good with the technology, so it's filtering both ways as well. Why do we do this project? 
So you can see here some before and after shots. So that before one is virtually looking at where the children's area is now. Over 280,000 residents called Logan City home, and there are nine library branches servicing the city. Logan Hyperdome is one of the larger branches as, and is located within close proximity to the M1, halfway between Gold Coast and Brisbane. <coughs> Community expectations regarding libraries have changed, particularly regarding technology. And we wanted to cater for this change whilst providing an environment for collaboration, experimentation and creative pursuits. Community consultation revealed that there was a growing need for adequate and appropriate seating and workstations with access to PowerPoints. Customers also require an adaptable, flexible space that can cater for large events and makerspace activities. Previously, the lower level of the library was used as a children's area. The overall goal was to reorganise the adult collection on the upper level and move the children's area into this space. The lower level was then freed to allow for the transformation into what is now the TLC lounge. So this is downstairs, this was the old um, children's collection, which took up the whole floor. And this is part of the construction, so there's a few pictures there. You can see how we've cleared the space. Okay, so what's it like now? Movable shelving has been introduced for the smaller library collections contained in the area. These collections, and this is in the TLC, include young adult, DVDs, newspapers and magazines. Casual seating, including many brightly coloured lounge chairs, have been introduced into the space as well. There is ample access to power around the room and plenty of tables and chairs, including bench type seating that enable shared work areas for both formal and informal purposes. At one end of the room, there are several corrals offering a more private study experience and they're very popular. There is a large and popular meeting room that has seen increased interest and usage since the opening of the TLC lounge. It's also very handy if we have a large event because we can wheel the collection into there. So. Being a fully flexible space, there are ample opportunities for the library service to assist with multi-generational community skill sharing via collaborative workshops and programs, whether they are for small business creative or educational needs. So there's been plenty of things happening in the space. Tech, learn, create are the three focus areas of the space. On any day, the space is filled with community members engaging with new technology or accessing the Wi-Fi with their own devices. There is often a class available for those interested in upskilling and the iPad classes draw a huge crowd. We have very popular Tech 4 classes, which many of you may have heard of. They are called the Tech 4 Toddlers, Tech 4 Kids, Tech 4 Adults, etc., etc. Lego literacy is held in the space on a regular basis, with a soon introduction of Lego robotics and Coda Dojo. Many just frequent the space for a place to meet informally, whether for business, study, or a shared interest. The 3D printer always draws a crowd, as it is in the public area, and we have seen interest from very use, varied users. For example, Plumbers, after bits and pieces that they can't purchase from a hardware store, and mums wanting uh, themed cookie cutters for their child's birthday party. Sporting enthusiasts have requested mounting equipment in order to place their cameras on their bikes. Sci-fi and fantasy fans are after Doctor Who, Star Wars and Star Trek themed collectibles, of course, and that includes a lot of the staff. <laughs> Gamers are after collectibles as well, and we have a regular user who's making soap and chocolate moulds. 
So that's a really beautiful thing and he's creating those himself. There is a link via our website to the TLC lounge and all that it offers. This is the most popular way for our customers to send us a 3D print job. There is also an option for them to print their own creation or select an item from Thingiverse. If they choose to create their own, we have the following programs available. And these are via our website, Blender, FreeCAD, OpenSCAD, and Sculptress. I've spoken about the big change that has happened downstairs in the TLC lounge. Those significant changes to the way we provide our services actually happened upstairs. With the children's area, and you can see that here, okay. um, now located upstairs on the ground level, it is easier for parents and carers to access the collection and programs. When previously many had to utilize the lift with prams um, and small children. What was once a dull area housing the reference and audio book collection is now a bright, vibrant and busy area with movable shelves and plenty of space for story time sessions. Also, the story time space when not being utilised um, can be um, transformed into a meeting room. Overall, we were amazed with how well the project came together. We received huge buy-in from all of the library teams when we ran a competition to name the space. And in order to undertake the changes, the Logan Hyperdome team reduced the overall collection by 16% over a 12-month period. We learned that you can never have enough PowerPoints and that flexibility in a space such as this is a key to it working. The 3D printer was also going to require a plastic movable shield due to the heat that it was generating because we wanted to keep it in the public area. Originally, we wanted to build a glass partition between the children's area and the rest of the library, and due to the cost, uh, we couldn't go ahead with that. We're so glad that we didn't, because it is so much more open and accessible, and the noise and everything else hasn't been an issue. The transformation has been amazing. Having a space such as a TLC lounge has been a wonderful asset to our library service and the way we provide services and programs to the community. Thank you. We started two years ago. I'll give you a quick rundown on what I think is important in the two years that we've been at uh, Gold Coast Tech Space. We started two years ago and the only nearby tech space was the Brisbane Hacker space. They are our buddies and we go and visit them from time to time. Some of us guys come from a software background, some from an electronics and hardware background and one or two of us actually, um, personally, my background was in um, all sorts of stuff with tools from sailing and what have you and then software. So. I had no electronics background, but the uh, focus of our tech space has ended up being very much in electronics. Now, I'll explain a bit more of that as I go along. Okay, a very quick rundown of how to start one up uh, that should be relevant to you folk. First off, you need a, a task group, I'll call in your case perhaps, or a committee. Only about seven people, a magic number. They've got to be doers, not talkers. You've got, you need people of action to get these things up and going, no question of it. Now, bear in mind, I'm talking from the um, private sector space. You guys will obviously uh, take some of this with a bit of a grain of salt, but there should be some crossover. So number one thing is getting the right people, and that's point one, to get it kicked off. That should be obvious, but it is very important. Get the wrong people, you're gonna go nowhere. So get the right people before you start. Number two is getting the right sort of space for what you want to do. If you haven't got a good space, again, if it's just an office sort of room or something like that, it's not probably going to work, and depending on what you're trying to do in the space. But we're very much um, focused on actually making, actually hacking, actually getting a bit down and dirty with hardware, not just software or just learning. A maker space is about physically using your hands to make hardware components of things, as well as software. 
Number three, obviously, get your members together, and the only reason that I mention that is your customers or members, you've got to work out what your objectives are and go with the flow depending on who comes in. You have to be flexible. In our case, it was what our members want, and we naturally gravitated towards certain things. But don't go in with a predefined plan of what you're going to do. It's the old quality type thing, customer focus. Don't go with uh, preconceptions. See what your people that come in want to do and move in that direction. Number four is events. If you're not running stuff, if you're not doing stuff, you're not a maker space. And communications, obviously, uh, if you don't communicate out what you are doing, you might as well not be there, basically. So you do need to have someone making an effort to make sure that what you are doing is being publicised. We actually don't do very well on that lately, tell you the truth, but, but we know it is important. Uh, incorporate, um, if anyone is incorporating or you need to, I'm not sure it's relevant to you guys, but Queensland Government's got the standard association rules, model rules, don't go trying to um, use anything else. Okay, now our focus at Gold Coast Tech Space, as opposed to the Brisbane one that's got a lot, a huge big area down by the port and they do a lot of hardware, we always were space constrained, so we tended to, uh, we naturally gravitated down to a maker space that was more into the electronics side of things that didn't need a lot of space and we simply didn't have the money for tools. We started completely from scratch with absolutely no budget. So Makerspace is our core, and from there, education, and part of the reason for education is educating ourselves, educating around our local areas, and particularly schools and private schools are particularly screaming to get us into the schools. Uh, all we've got to do is get them to unleash some money, and then we'll be in there more sort of thing. But lots of people want us to do stuff for nothing, believe me. Uh, but the community outreach thing is really what gives you a bit of um, credo as well. You guys are, uh, as librarians, obviously your core of community there. And might I say, actually, I believe that um, maker spaces really are totally suited to be in libraries. I think it is the place for them, partly from an economic perspective. Hopefully you guys have already got budget. You've already got buildings somewhere if you can make the correct sort of decisions on how you set up a physical space that's attractive for people to actually come in and do stuff. Uh, now, we also uh, had co-working happening, which is just people in the space during the day that were helping to fray costs, basically, as much as anything, and we focused a lot on people that were wanting to do business startups uh, in tech, particularly, and then the idea was we would also uh, outreach to our buddies in Silicon Lakes, who are currently next door to us, and any of those business people or any people getting into tech that were making good stuff and starting to commercialise it could also go into an incubator or an accelerator. And we believe that that is where maker spaces should have some feed in as well. So that's the fourth point in the pre-incubator. Challenges as I see it are basically twofold that I'd leave with you. One is the mindset. Maker space is all about creativity. It's all about trying to get people to take initiative to actually do something, particularly with their hands as well. A lot of people are good at thinking about things, but they're not really good at actually starting to build something, particularly in little groups, getting together informally and take an interest in something and then do something about it, start to build something, particularly as your excellent panel was saying before, pull things to bits and wreck stuff and don't build it correctly and make mistakes. That is definitely part of make, is making mistakes as you're making. And it's important that, you, that people understand that, that they can hack up stuff that falls to bits 20 minutes later. That doesn't matter, they'll learn, they'll get better, they have to start somewhere. And a lot of people these days just don't have capability with their hands. Maybe it's just me, but I always was in an environment where I had to build stuff from yachts to stables, and you name it. Uh, and I'm really surprised at people that are, can't even really wield a hammer properly, and I think that's rather sad, and I think that uh, libraries and maker spaces should encourage people to actually start doing things again. Uh, and the other um, point is that um, institutionalism, now this is one I thought was especially appropriate to you guys because um, uh, 
a lot of people go through a school system and go into uh, particularly the public sector, into libraries, what have you, and you're, you're never out in, in a place where you've got that creativity. And I've worked in big institutions myself, and I know that it, it, you can get a mindset and therefore encourage it also on people that are in there, or at least discourage people to be a bit bohemian and make a space and creativity does involve people being able to be a little bit bohemian. So it's a little bit of a challenge to try and um, foster that in the way that you actually run the space yourself as much as you can, because you need to foster people be being confident to, as I say, have a go. And that is very important. Nothing will happen if you just have a formal sort of setup and you get people to sit there and you show them something and in some cases, that's a way to bring people on, but you've really got to go to those people and say, look, what are you interested in? Or get them together, see what, on the side, see what they're doing, and then encourage them all, go ahead and get it. There's a hammer over there, go and use it. There's a particularly soldering iron, show people how to solder, to, to build little electronic things. Get them confident to do those sorts of things and get them on teaching other people as well, but get them to take initiative. Say, okay, you can do that, whatever you can do. Can you do a 10 minute talk on that? to the guys or whoever. So get them involved as much as you can, get creativity going, get people confident. And the other challenge right now um, I have to throw in is that uh, particularly right now with the combination of our uh, global economy and the way that we're more or less going backwards as the third world goes up, coupled with uh, three levels of conservative governments right now, personally as far as we're concerned, but I've heard earlier here as well, uh, you do have a problem with funding. Everything is kind of being closed down right now. Uh, to try and really encourage this massive um, move into technology and uh, massively increased take up in technology by many other countries. I'm afraid Australia is going out the back door very, very fast and it's only being exacerbated by the current conservative atmosphere and all our levels of government. That has a direct impact on us. Our funds of, that were looking like starting to come through probably aren't, and it may have a very detrimental impact on the te our tech space as well. You guys will be the same. Uh, I know that budget's been cut in the last um, uh, federal bu uh, budget and what have you, and that really does have an impact. So you have to plan, okay, how am I going to still run a, play, a space? What's important? And you're going to have to probably be looking at some user pays aspects if you're going to survive. Uh, so funding, getting on to that, because I'm afraid it comes down to dollars a lot and I'm very aware of it, we are anyway. Um, events and sponsorship are probably the best ways to get funding because you're providing value to sponsors. They, they've got a, uh, um, a public um, exposure from it and that's of value to people. Membership certainly, uh, and for a start, corporate membership. Um, which in your case is more or less, uh, again, budget, but trying to get out to other departments, get other departments involved if you can, and try and, try and purloin some of their budget if you can into it. Uh, the, not the best thing are grants. You can forget about grants. Um, it's more a private sector thing, actually. And, and uh, uh, Don't get into raffles or any sort of other activities. I'm sure you guys won't anyway, um, but you can just waste time on things like that, um, and it burns your members. Events. We're actually uh, part of outreach and what have you. Uh, we really need to be visible. Gold Coast Science Fair is, um, apart from a minor problem this year where we're not sure we're even going to do it this year, but um, the, uh, those, these are the sorts of events that you should be out being in the community doing, your local shows, your science fair type things, any of those council programs that have got tech in them, they do want, they will want you there. School holiday programs, we've done a couple of them through the libraries. Um, kids games on weekends like Minecraft type things and Lego, those, all of those sorts of things. Um, members special interest groups, anyone that comes into your space that has another special interest group, like in our case software interest groups like Drew Powell and um, uh, WordPress, 
those sorts of things for software groups, encourage them to come in and use the space and that's how you get those sorts of people to come into the space at other times and join up or what have you. So there's lots of related groups. You um, probably speak the converter there because I know the libraries are pretty good at that. And we certainly have, um, we're, we're in fact going to be at Helensvale Library on Saturday actually all day um, on one of their um, team tech it's called, I don't know if anyone's aware of Teen Tech, I guess a lot of you must be, uh, but Helens Vale Library's doing something there and we're part of that. So yeah, other meetups and related groups that we run like bar camps and what have you as well, all pulls people into the space. And um, if you're not running, as I said before, if you're not running events, you're not doing anything. It, it's all about have a space, yes, but then run events, as many as you possibly can, because that's where you're going to get all your interested people. That's where you're going to find your doers, your movers and your shakers, and you'll get them to help join you. And I believe with the library, it'll be no different. And you need a way to even recompense some of those people that are of value that can turn up and help run informal programs uh, in your space. The future, as far as we're concerned, uh, we're looking for a new space. That We're in our third space, which is in the Rabina Community Centre. We actually started in what was perhaps an ideal space. It was just a huge industrial, or well not huge, it was a medium-sized industrial shed about the size of this room. Uh, but the rents were killing us, so we moved to something that was a bit more like a old office area where most of it was taken up by our co-workers that funded it and we had a small area out the back for our hackers twice a week. Uh, we're used to 24-7 access and we do like that. Uh, that's another thing, by the way. Uh, it's really good to have um, an informal arrangement as much as you can for if you've got members and keys in any way that people can come in and little groups of two or three with some sort of control, obviously, and can work on projects in their own time because that's where the creativity comes from as well. For those regular members. And I think that's probably it. Have I got to the end? Yes, I have. So there you go. Thank you very much. This is Pence for Rebecca. But the question was, you mentioned something about people sending their 3D printing in. Yes. And so I was just wondering how you managed that and how you funded it, and even the whole um, providing the 3D printing to the community, how you fund that. OK. so. There's quite a few questions there. Um, I can give you my email address, but I can give you a, a brief overview of what we do. So um, basically, um, people um, go to our website, um, they select a job and they send it through to us. We use uh, the software that was provided with the 3D printer, so we've not had any great expenses in that area. Um, it comes through to us and then we put it on a sp spreadsheet and um, we load it that way. So quite simply, um, we, we've done it that way, so, yeah. So you're just, so it's sort of just how are you going to continue to provide okay. materials and Yeah, so, yeah so, so there's a bit of that. So we're, we're learning as well, so we don't have all the answers. Um, so at the moment, we've got about 20 jobs waiting. Um, we have an understanding with the customers that um, you know, they're produced at a certain time, they're happy. We try and um, produce them as quickly as we can, as at a high standard as possible. One thing we have found with producing items for customers was that um, mistakes happen and they expect them to come out bright and shiny and new and they're not looking as shiny as they might expect them to. Um, yeah, so we also find that we need to print within the operating hours of the library, and some jobs take a significant amount of time. Uh, when you're printing, for example, if it was a really big job, um, we'd have to you know, stop the job and then restart it, and that then the job doesn't look as nice. So it's, it's having those conversations with the customers and then maybe getting them to go back and select something that's a little bit smaller. So for example, if someone wanted a TARDIS um, at 100% and it was going to take 20 something hours, we may encourage them to do a smaller one, like a 30% that would take us, you know, we're open from, from nine in the morning to eight at night. So that sort of time period, so. We, we sort of have those types of conversations, or if they want a bigger product, then we, um, 
they just have to have it with maybe not looking as perfect, so, yeah. Now I can say Helens Vale Library has also got a 3D printer. Uh, we started, we've got two RepRap 3D printers. That was the first thing we did when we started. Um, I'd concur with what was said before. They're not really, including even Helens Vale Library, um, which cost, theirs cost 50 odd thousand. Ours cost uh, about $500 for the first one, about 350 for the second one. These are RepRap Prusa 2s. And the quality's not really there. Um, just to give you a quick rundown 3D printing, they, there was a patent out which expired after 25 years recently, you might know, but, well, expired, what, six, eight years ago now, and that's why we've now got the explosion of all these uh, printers. But there are commercial printers around from the times of the patents, they've been around for decades, and you can go and get a, a job printed and it costs an arm and a leg, and that's why they're only for high-end use. For out in the community, yes, we're now using all of these open source type printers, and we've improved our printers ourselves because they're open source. We, we built them ourselves, and as I said before, that's the only way to do it in my view, because you're a maker, so why not make them yourself, put someone in charge, and, and keep them up and running? Okay, you've got a whole business aspect to it, as from what you're talking about, which is customer come and want something done and what have you, so you just got to set that up as a, pretty much a separate business in a way within your maker space, it's a commercial operation, and make sure you've got uh, people there running it who are obviously got a vested interest in what have you, they're running it as their own business on the side with some arrangement with you or something like that, is the way I'd recommend it. And, you ha and, and they will have to be experts in those printers and keeping them going properly so that they can get a good enough result. We've done a couple of commercial jobs and it's been for people that have wanted prototypes of very expensive stuff and they've wanted something out reasonably quickly. So we've proven that we can do it. And if we had someone of our members that wanted to start that as a business, we would encourage them to do so. Any other questions? Up the, there's one at the back and one down the front. Hello, could I ask you, did you say you're operating at the moment from Rabina Community Centre? Yeah, that's right. Yeah, opposite, next to the library. That's right, opposite the library. Is there, yeah. a, just, do you have a permanent room in there? Yes, we do. Okay, and does it, does the makerspace operate um, as a, Hobby centre, or it's 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 self. Um, yeah, um, our, the, our members, uh, full members, used to when we started used to um, pay a hundred dollars a month, and we fortunately did have some members that were putting that much in. Currently, we're right down to full membership is uh, I've got to remember now twenty five dollars a month, and members come in. Um, it's gravitated to a pretty much a Wednesday night, a Friday night, and a Sunday afternoon for members. And guests can come, and I have a guest session every second Thursday night to introduce guests to it so they don't get in the way of our members, because when members come in, we've got, in our, in our current space, we only got physically room for about a dozen people in there at a time, which is, which is no good at all as a maker space. Our, our initial earlier ones that had more room and we could make a mess in were, were far more conducive to it. So we would have anything from 20 to 25 in on a member's night. Um, and they would be, um, it's frenetic. People coming in all directions. Sometimes we'd start a program, it would say like, we're on Meetup. You can find us on meetup.com, GC Tech Space. And, and when we first started, we'd say, okay, tonight we're going to do something with Arduinos or whatever. And, um, and now we've got our own variant of Arduinos that some of our guys have actually commercialised. In fact, I've got some stuff here I was going to demonstrate or whatever afterwards if you're interested. But when members come in, um, no matter what we've organised, it's like herding cats. That's why I say we've learnt to just let it flow. So we might start with a theme of the night and not even get near what we're talking about because people come in and are just so enthused and doing other stuff totally and that's the way the evening goes. And you might have 15 people working on a total of anything from three or four to 15 different sort of projects during the night because a lot of people collaborate on two or three different things. But they just do that naturally. And, and that, to me, is the ideal way to get the creativity going. Provide the place and stand back, basically. Or give little helps from on the side. 
We've got time for one last question at the back. I'm just um, going back to a previous question, clarifying just a couple of things. I'm Lisa Miller from Gold Coast Libraries. Um, we aren't partners with um, Gold, Te Gold Coast Tech Space. We work together at times and uh, programs all overlap at times. So we have sometimes a common uh, audience, but not always. Um, so we're just supportive of each other's programs, but we sort of we work in quite different areas. As David was saying before, our 3D printer is quite different to the RepRap. It's not plastic extrusion. It's run on a plaster type um, product. And going back to a previous question, we accept uh, files from customers in a format that the, um, the computer can accept and print out. We run it through our, our um, computer to see what it looks like. We can check for flaws before it's printed. If it's not acceptable, if it recognises there's going to be too many flaws in it, we'll give it back to the customer, it's their work, ask them to correct it and resubmit it to us. The program will also be able to calculate the cost of it. We do it on a cost recovery basis. And for ours, it's $5 a cubic metre. That covers the costs of our equipment uh, servicing of, of it at all, at, if we need it, which is, I think, an annual occurrence. And that's all. We don't make money out of it. So I just want to answer that question that was submitted earlier. Um, ours is, as I said, it's a high-end computer, a high-end 3D printer. It's expensive and it's maintenance-free. Yeah, if anyone's got any um, thoughts about commercialising at all, it's well worth uh, speaking to the Helens Vale people and Lisa there to um, get a rundown on, on the best way to make it work because I'm not sure if anyone else around here has got that sort of experience out of a library in commercialising them.